webinar on software usability, necessary even or true differentiator. I'm Selena D'Souza, your host for this session, and I'm really glad to see all of you here today. Thanks for taking time off your busy schedules to attend this session, and we hope that you find it really useful. Uh, now, before we get started, I'd like to outline the structure for the webinar. We would take about uh, 15 minutes for the presentation, about 10 minutes for a Q&A session at the end. If you have any questions, Please feel free to type them into the chat window on the right-hand uh, side of your screen. Now, I'd like to give you a brief uh, intro about Aspire. Aspire Systems is a pioneer in the outsourced product development space. We have worked with over 80 ISVs and software-enabled businesses and helped them build better software. Uh, We've uh, released over 1,050 products till date, and uh, we've pioneered the concept of product tiering, which is a unique methodology for building products better and faster. Now, as part of product tiering, we practice usability engineering, and that's the reason we've chosen this topic today. Um, Aspire has won awards, uh, the, re the most recent being uh, a ranking in Silicon India among the top 10 to be among the top 10 OPD in, uh, product engineering services companies in the U.S. Uh, today, I'd just like to go ahead and introduce our speakers. So, Prakash Nagaswamy is our first speaker for today. He is a senior solutions architect at Aspire System. Prakash has over 13 years of experience in developing products, and he's worked with several leading IT majors, including HPL and co uh, He has deep knowledge of... Uh, architecture and is currently a key member of Aspire's ATG. We also have uh, Yomaz Osanir, who is the Director of Engineering at Winfolio. Yomaz comes with over 10 years of experience developing several mission-critical systems. He's worked in several domains, including an online credit card company. He's worked in the financial services, mortgage, and uh, banking sectors as well. Uh, at Akamai, he is led, he's distinguished distinguished himself at Akamai uh, for over five years. He's worked there and been instrumental in developing an automated platform, which has improved self-service capabilities of, for customers and reduced costs substantially. So Winfolio has also been Aspire's customer for the last one and a half years, and they, they're co-presenting this webinar for us. Uh, I'd like to go forward and present our agenda for today. So what is usability, why it matters, what are the misconceptions and guidelines? So this would be covered by Prakash and it would be a very brief introduction. It would take about 10 minutes. And then we'd go on to the actual case analysis of WinSeller, uh, which is uh, part of our customer's uh, uh, product. And what are the lessons that we learned from there? It would actually show you how, uh, how, how the product was before uh, usability engineering was applied and what are the lessons learned, what are the improvements and the results that were shown after that. Uh, we'll then move on to some of the technology enablers for usability, usability life cycle, and a quick checklist of things to remember when, when going in for usability engineering. At the end of it, again, we'll have a, like I said before, we'll have a Q&A session for about 5-10 minutes where you can pose any questions you may have to the speakers, and we'll address it at the end of it. But at any point of time, you can type your questions on the chat window. So without any further ado, let's get started. Uh, Prakash, over to you. Thank you, Selena. Good morning, everybody. Today I'm going to talk about uh, software usability. Is it a necessary evil for your product or is it a true differentiator? We'll find out at the end of our session. Definitely we'll have a consensus of what the software usability is all about. Generally, software usability is perceived as synonym to look and feel, which is certainly not true because software usability is more than the look and feel. Let me just briefly tell you what this software usability is. It's a quality attribute that assesses your user interface, how easy it is for a user to use it. In simple term, it simply covers the quality of service with aesthetics, accessibility, consistency, and completeness. So why do you think it's so important for 
product companies to see usability as an important factor in their product life cycle. Today, if you take any product, you have a lot of competition. Minimum, you would see a five competitive product in the similar domain. So there is a lot of competition, and the products are more of user centric. So you can't keep on adding features over a period of time because you would exhaust the list of features and you'll reach a saturation point. And definitely the user interface is the first line of interaction for any product and the customer is the first person to judge on it. So definitely you need a lot of customer satisfaction to really bring the target audience as your repeat customers. So this kind of draws out the essence of why the usability is so important for a product. So definitely you have seen a lot of success in recent times with the usability in practice. And good example I can talk about is the iPhone. Definitely before the iPhone, you would have noticed all the phones have a lot of feature set from different vendors, popular models, but still none break out the shackle of being the top most product in the market. Definitely when iPhone came out, it came up with the innovative way of interaction, how the information is presented. And definitely you will fall flat for the first time when you see the interface for iPhone. And there is a contrary to this usability also. If it is not done properly, definitely you would lose your customers. There are many examples you can quote about the bad usability. Let me just give an example. In real life, what I just felt that when I actually want, walked into a bank, where I had checked, taken out a loan, and the bank manager was supposed to intimate me when there is a change of rates. Of course, he's using one of the leading banking solution. And to my surprise, he has given, he is not able to change the rate of interest, even though it has actually reduced, because he doesn't know the product very much. In fact, he didn't portray that he didn't know the product very well. He said the product doesn't support it. As an end customer, you really don't want to lose money on your home loans. Initially, I thought it was a product limitation, but after discussing with the manager and giving a thought about how it could be possible, I went back to the bank, and to my surprise, he said, sir, I found out. He said, sir, it was so difficult for me to find out what you're asking. That shows how difficult is the product to use it, and he was about to lose a customer. And this is an example I can just quote. And probably you would have seen a lot more bad examples in your day-to-day -day -day use. So why it really matters for the end users? You have many choices in the product market. I already mentioned about that. When you have poor usability, you are not only losing your revenue, but giving it to your competition. That is the important aspect of it. Because you are giving it free of cost. They don't have to do any marketing. You are actually doing a marketing for them by having a poor usability in your product. And in the contrary, but if you have excellent usability, definitely you will get a lot of audience. And today, with the web, the good news spreads like a fire. And you would have seen the success of iPhone and Gmails. So with all this said, still why people are not taking the usability as a serious content? Why there are only few takers for usability? Many times I quoted that people have a misconception about usability as a synonym for look and feel. But it is not the only thing. There are many misconceptions which prevents companies from adapting usability as a mainstream in their design process. I can outline few of them. Many times people feel usability is very expensive. You don't have to have a million dollar usability lab for your usability testing. Of course, you need to have a person who is aware of usability. And you'll be able to achieve what you are looking for by understanding your target audience and able to spend as little as 10% of your design budget for usability to really design a better usability for your product. 
and many times developer community have a wrong notion that I can add usability at a later point of time. Of course, you would have seen in your practice, you cannot bring usability back at a later point of the product development life cycle. It has to be thought through right from the beginning, from design through development through implementation. You don't have to worry about the launch dates when you consider usability. All you need to care about is the very critical aspects of user requirement. Many times users don't complain about usability. You need to seek out the people. You need to understand. With all this said, definitely you will be able to bring usability to your design principles. And work on improving the usability for your product. So let me give a brief guidelines of how we can really address these areas. Know your target audience well. Nobody wants to really wait when they are working with the product. And that is particularly true when you are dealing with the web products. Improve a response time. Provide what is critical for your user. Don't overload information. And there are a lot of technology tools available today. Use asynchronous information display. Provide user graceful exits. Users are tend to make mistakes. And it is natural. You should allow them to roll back. You should allow them to manipulate within their limited constraint. Never ask the user to repeat the information what he has already given. So with these practices in mind, definitely you will be able to bring difference in your product. And my co-speaker, Yomas, is going to reiterate those things with this presentation. How usability has really change how they build the product and how it has been evolved from what they have today from the previous versions. Now I hand over to Yomas, please. Uh, Yomas, go ahead, please. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Yomas Osner. I'm Director of Engineering at Centralio, so I'm um, glad you could all join us today. Um, I'm, I'd like to talk about um, our work uh, on a recent project uh, along with Aspire on a rewrite of uh, one of our main systems. But first, I'll, I'll give you a brief um, history of the company and who we are. We are a wine, um, online wine-related company. We do cellar management, which is wine cellar management for, uh, for people who collect wine, people who are looking to get into wine, people, basically anybody from the person who has thousands of bottles to the person who's just buying supermarket wine uh, and enjoying getting into wine. So we have cellar management online. People can manage their wine collection to track it for investment purposes, track it just to see what wine they should be drinking with a certain type of meal. So it covers a really wide spectrum of people. Uh, along with that, we do e-commerce. So we sell wine online, and we mostly sell fine wine online, so more of the expensive collectible type wine. So we have a, we have a free community type seller management solution as well as a, a web store. So everything for us is all about being online and being as usable and as accessible online as possible. So our, our site provides wine buying tools, it has a community, um, so it really gives people um, everything that they need to know about wine, and we serves all of, all of their, their questions and, and, and is a, a good tool for research. Uh, about the company, we are an agile company, we do, uh, we're a fairly small team, um, we do everything agile, so you know, we get things out quickly and we're very really looking at always improving what we have based on feedback, and you will see as I go through the demonstration how we've done that. So um, let's talk about the main use case that I'd like to cover today. Uh, the system is called Vincela. It's our online cellar management system. And also, along with that, it's uh, where our, uh, people come to look at uh, community-related uh, aspects of, of wine collecting. So we have a, a large community of 15,000 ongoing users who come into the site, and that's growing every day. Uh, since, since we've done the rewrite, it's actually growing a lot faster than, uh, than before, so that's you know, one metric that we're really happy with. Uh, to give you a sense of how big it is, we have 2.5 million bottles of wine cataloged in our system from users, so that's a, a good amount of wine, and the, the actual value of it is probably close to half a billion dollars worth of wine. So it's a lot of wine that we have in the system, and a lot of users that come in 
and there's a lot of processing that goes on in the background. So you can think of it almost as being something similar to a bank for wine. We have a lot of uh, people managing their accounts in our system. So what we did was uh, the, the company, the site has been around for probably four years now, and we two years ago decided we needed to to rewrite it. It was very simple, and I, you, you'll see a screenshot of one of the pages later on that really shows you what the site looked like. But it was very there were problems with it, and we decided we really to get to being a web 2.0 site to really be a site that draws people in and gets new people on board and serves even the, the existing users who have um, you know who are very committed. We wanted to really get into social networking, we wanted to get into Web 2.0, make, things, make the experience a lot more uh, enjoyable for people. We, we, we basically started out by saying, what do we have that's wrong? And this is what you would do when you look at a site. You decide what's wrong and you can really catalog all the problems that you have. So these are the, these are the things that we, you know, that we really identified. Pages were slow, interface wasn't uh, intuitive, and things we wanted people to use were, were not available in easy to reach places. And for some people who had very large sellers, the performance just wasn't there. So it was unusable for a lot of our main customers. So taking that into account, we did some more research. And uh, you know, we went out there. We, um, we met people and, and got feedback and all of that. And I'll go into that more of the process later. But once we get, get identify the problems, you really want to say, how do you want to fix them? What are the objectives uh, for the new system and, and how, what, how you're going to improve things? So one of the main things was we want to improve the speed. We wanted to make sure that things were, all the features were available to people in an easy to use way so that they could self-service as much as possible. So self-service to me is very big because from Akamai I worked in that department and I can see how it reduces your cost uh, in terms of your customer service department, in terms of your overall department because with us we have a lot of um, people buying wine and we have a physical back end where we are shipping things and you know, we have a, a huge infrastructure and workflow that if we can reduce the uh, time that it takes to interrupt automated processes through uh, customer calls, it's much better and our customers also feel more in control when they can self-serve. So it's very important for your site to be usable from that aspect and that allows you to retain customers and you know, really just keeps a good relationship with your customers. So giving them all the tools that they can to be in control, things like customization, making the site really feel like it's works for them. We have people who collect thousands of bottles of wine and they want to look at all the minute details of how it's performing against, you know, different markets, uh, market industries. They want to look at how, um, you know, when they should be drinking wine, when they should be selling wine. Other people just want to browse the site and get a sense of what people are drinking right now and, and, and get a, a sense of what they might want to spend, you know, their next $20 purchase on. And so it's, it has to really be customizable for all these types of users. And at the same time, you want your site to be really open to getting content. We have a small company. We can't really have a lot of people to contribute content to the site, although we do a lot of that. We want our users to really feel empowered to do that so that it makes the site more valuable for everybody. And, that, you know, it's just a web 2.0 principle of getting crowdsourcing, getting, getting the site to really serve and, and evolve based on what users are doing. And, you know, just like Facebook, the only reason you go to Facebook is because everyone else is there. You wouldn't go there if there was only one other person on Facebook. So, uh, we, you know, if you were to graphically illustrate what our goals would be, these, you know, we are taking four of the main things, kind of plot how well you're doing and how well you want to do on these on these different scales, and you can kind of get a visual of what your targets are. And that's these are the four axes that I, I think were important to us, and I think we pretty much met these goals. So this is one way you might want to illustrate your objectives. So I'll talk a bit about the process. You know, we collected feedback. We went out and did research through polls and, and forums. And we really got, uh, went through our sales, our case management system. And we went through and looked at all our customer cases and really found, you know, plotted all the, uh, the main issues that we're having. We categorized by different departments. And you know, we do agile developers, so we collect user stories all the time. But we really did this from a customer perspective. So when you're doing usability, you're really thinking about how does the customer feel when they use our system? So you get a sense of all the pain that they feel by going through your, your, your case management system and, and gathering the data. So we did that from the user perspective. We went into the database and looked at click through paths and looked at errors we'd had and really an analyzed performance on different things and really found where the bottlenecks were and really tried to do it from the back end and from the front end to get a sense of where the system was performing poorly. 
and then we started working on on revising things and I'll go through the process later but during during that process we're always as an agile company releasing things out to users and, and beta testing our site was actually available fairly early on as a private site for people to beta test so it was it's a really good thing to get feedback from the real end user as quickly as possible so that you have as much time to assimilate that into your system and really have it come out when it comes out publicly as as good as possible. I mean, I think Google Mail was in beta for probably um, a year and, you know, people were only allowed to come in by invitation. It's the same kind of thing that you want to do. You want to make your site available, even though it may not look good, you want people to really drive your product um, development process as much as possible, especially when it's Web 2.0. And at the same time, we did competitive analysis. We went and looked at our competitors and saw what features they had. And so, you know, it's just a way of keeping up with what, what's happening in your in your segment is very important. And um, one thing we did, being a small company, which you know was a little bit outside uh, what you might have in terms of budget, is we got an uh, expert company to come in to help us with usability. But having said that, you might want to do that once. And then I think right now we're all... We, we, we've learned the lessons from that and we really feel like we can move forward with the next project without that help. But I think it really helps to get somebody who's focused on this to really come in and kind of spread the word in your company and get you feeling, getting the concepts into you. And it's like unit testing. When that first came around, no one was doing it. But once you get it into your daily routine and into your uh, development process, it, it just feeds, um, feeds everything that you're doing and really uh, improves the, the general pr product as a whole. So it, Getting somebody to, to help you with usability might be a good solution um, to do just so that you can kickstart it in your organization. So um, we, uh, I think I lost control. Hold on for one second. I'm not sure if I'm controlling it or someone else is controlling it. I think I've lost control. Uh, does someone have control of the slides? Uh, you have it, uh, Yoman. Uh, I think it just disappeared on me. Okay, it somehow give us a second. Sorry about that, everyone. Just hold by. Stand by, please. We're back, Yoman. Okay. Sorry about that, everyone. Go ahead. Okay. So, so uh, a few things that you might want to do is take your site, you know, you know your domain, you really want to understand what your users are, uh, are looking at and you want to catalog the important aspects that your site needs to have. So these were what we came up with, familiarity, keeping things simple, making sure that things load quickly. We, we set a limit on all our pages to be less than 500 milliseconds. We want our actions that are important to be easy to understand or easy to, for people to, to see. So you want to have focal points on the page that match what's important to you. And you want users to be able to customize things. So having preferences and allowing people to save actions that they do most, uh, you know, a lot of common actions allows them to really feel like they can, they can come in and get, get going quickly instead of having to do multiple clicks to do some complicated workflow. So we have some, I, I'll show you some examples later. And then at the same time, you know, the, lesson that you learn is with Agile, you're always learning from what's going on and you're putting that data back into the system. So talking a little bit about the process now and the real, you know, hands-on work, this is what, you know, this is our typically our process that we follow for, for you know, and we think about usability all the time and it's really just pervading our, our design and development process. What, what we do is interaction modeling. We, 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 we go in and we take the user story and we really look at what a user is going to be interacting with and we, we we, we design with, from the screens back to the back end. So we, we really take what someone would be seeing on a page and we come up with a wireframe that really shows on paper what a page looks like and talks about all the different pieces of the page, why things are located where they are, what people expect to see, what, what should be shown when you click on something. So it really is an on-paper model of a, of a web workflow that shows how a site's going to work. And if you take all those wireframes and put them in a document, that's your website on paper, and you can really get. I, I learned this when I when I came here. I took that the wireframe document and I just went through it, and I really understood how the site was intended to work. And it gives you a good sense of the overall information flow, 
and gives you a good sense of, of where the common paradigm is going on. It really helps. So these paper prototypes you know, really help you to, to understand the site, and then you, know, you can just keep from there building uh, HTML mock interfaces and, and then hopefully enabling them with um, actual dynamic um, database and all interactions uh, and releasing that to people. So user testing, all of this is important to do as soon as you've got um, your first mock interface is done, develop, develop a, a standalone version of it and give it to people to test. So that's what we do. We just pretty much do that iteratively on and on and on. And when, when we developed Vintilla, this is an idea of what, we've, what we did. We have took all our screens and care of the wireframes and really came up with a screen map that tells you all the different parts of the system. So this is pretty complicated, but it gives you an overall global view of what your site and your information flow is so that you can really get a sense of where you need to make things, have have like a main home page that diverts into five different places and then really hierarchically structure your site so that people can see the most important things up front and then they can dive into different deeper sections, detailed sections as, as they need to. So this really helps you to understand where to make things simple and where to, make things, where to expose complexity. So that may not be a tool everyone uses, but I think it was very helpful for us to get a global sense of the site doing it that way. This is a, a wireframe. It, it really shows you what a page looks like. If you see the, the blue kind of um, faded out, but that's a page that's behind a pop-up that would show up. And this pop-up is actually a detail. Uh, the page behind it would normally show up without the pop-up there. That would be a simplified version of the page. This is when you're adding wine. Somebody clicks on a link, it brings up the pop-up, and then it, sh it just shows you the multi-layered um, aspect of a page. On the left, we have notes that really describe what a page is doing and why things are on a page and, and gives a sense, person a sense of the business rules behind, behind a page. Okay, so now that we've talked about the process and the wireframes, this is our old site. This, this is an example of, um, this is our new site. Okay, this is our uh, old site. And this is what people would see when they logged in. And it's not bad. It gives people a sense of, you know, we were really a seller management system. So this is a list of wine that someone owns. Well, you know, there's a lot of tabs at the top. And um, it's, you know, it's got some actions up here. And we actually kept some of the same logic, kept some of the same layout because we didn't want to make it too drastically different for the new site. But I'll explain what we did next. We, we designed a new homepage. We wanted to have things like social. We've got active users. I mean, we've got lots of lots more graphics, and it, people tend to feel a lot more engaged when they see some poker points. So active users gives them a nice thing to play with. They can go and browse other people's activity. They get activity on the site. So it's social networking on the left. It's very different. We're not really looking at wines. We're looking more at community activity around wine. Here you have a seller summary. It gives you a sense of how much you own. So it's really a dashboard like a bank account. You're getting a sense of the global picture of your wine, and you can dive down into the next view, which is like the old view. But you don't see it straight away. You see a home page. And then we have tasting notes. So tasting notes are a big, a big part of wine. It's all about finding out what people are saying about good wine and, and, and wines that you own, what people are saying about them, so you can get a sense of how, um, you know, how well people are, are looking at uh, or how people are reacting to wines that you like. And so that, you know, there's a whole lot of, of things here, community-related and, and specific to you. And in the top right, that's our common paradigm. We have where you would find the tasks that you would normally do. So we have common tasks linked there so you can easily reach them. And at the top, we have our main global navigation that never changes. So like an iPhone, the bottom, you know, the bottom bar on an app never really changes, and they'll reject your app if you don't, don't keep that the same. So you always have this global navigation wherever you go. We didn't have that in the old screen. We just really had a lot of tabs that weren't really distinguishable. But this gives you a sense of good organization of information. So we've got we've got that in every place so people really know when they want to go somewhere, they go to the top and they go home, they go to my cellar, they know how to get to things from wherever they are. So there's always a sense of, uh, of, of um, a way to get back to your origin. And then one other thing which I haven't really talked about when you design for usability is since search is so big these days in internet, just anywhere, you know, Google search is just one search box on a page and everyone uses that. It's the simplest usable interface you could ever imagine. You've got to really put search on your site. So you, you have, we have search boxes on every main page that we have. If you, if you actually go to our site and look at, at, at all our pages, you will see a search box everywhere. So that lets people really go from, 
from one page to any other page by doing a search. It just gives them an easy jump through navigation and, and gives them the option to get that information really quickly. We never had search in our old interface and it was just, you know, people had to know which button to click on and then which other button to click on to get somewhere. So with search, you have, you know, easy jump, jumping off points and jumping into points anywhere you go. Now the next page, which is your seller page, is probably the most important page for most people who are looking at wine. Uh, somehow it skipped. Um, trying to get back. Sorry. Seems to be going forward every time I go back. Oops. Okay. So this is our seller page. It looks a lot like the old page, but you'll notice a few key differences. Um, first, we've added more information uh, into the table view, but we also have an options thing, which is really a preference. People can really display what they want to see, so they can control the columns, they can control, control the layout a lot more, and then we in, there's a My Account link up here where they can control a lot more information about how different columns show up, so it can really be customizable. The next thing is where they where they search, um, they, can, they can save a search under their filters, so my filters, they can really do a lot of things where people might want to always come in and look at their French wine. It's very difficult in the, in the old system to do that because you've got to go and click on criteria and, and set up a search and then, and, and then search, but you can never save it. So now we, people have options to save searches, and a lot of people use this to just really look at data that they're always going to come back to week to week. So that's important. And then you've got your search, which is everywhere, and then you've got your standard navigation with, with your actions that are available everywhere else. So the home page had these in links, but here it's in buttons, and that's uh, one discrepancy, but we we kept it that way just so that in in the non-home pages, everything is available through, through buttons. And if you'll notice that uh, we have some gray buttons and we have some red buttons, the red buttons are the ones that are most important. They'll draw your eye quickly, so these are the ones that you want to have users come to before, you know, as the main actions, and then you've got the gray bu buttons, which are kind of secondary actions. People don't do these as much, so you want to kind of blend those more into the background than the red button. So that gives you a sense of when you when you decide what you want to do, you have to come up with a usability scheme and keep things consistent and come up with a way that really gets people to do uh, the actions that they're looking to do, so draw, draw their attention with focal points, and that's what the red and the gray um, achieves. And then... You know, it, it, uh, you know, I could dive down into more, but I, I don't think we'll have the time today. And if, if you have the time, I'd, I'd highly recommend that you um, go into into the site and, and take a look. Okay, so if I can figure out how to get to the next slide, that would be great. Um, okay, so as, as well as doing it from a usability point of view on the, on the front end, uh, you design the screens and you really want to have the user understand the site really well. You've got to work on the back end and really put that into practice in, in the code. Uh, we're a Java shop, so you know we did a lot of, um, I'll go into tools specific to Java later on, but we did a lot of things that really in Web2.0 um, you need to be doing these days. We've done widespread AJAX and asynchronous loading, so a lot of pages come up, and, and we also made sure that the pages themselves are really lightweight, so you use things like Yslow to really look at how you're loading your JavaScript and images and, and compressing things and, and combining things and making sure that you don't have too many graphical elements on a page. Um, you really want to you know, go look at the Apple Human Interface Guidelines. It's great for you to understand how to present information on a small screen. Uh, and it also gives you an idea of that you don't really need to display a lot of information for an interface to be usable. Uh, and then we, we did some database improvements and, and loading of data. We, we were loading too much data before that wasn't being displayed. You should only be loading the data that you're displaying to a user, and you'll, when you realize that, you realize that you only need to do queries that get you back a really small amount of data, which will improve your site page load time dramatically. And then uh, you want to index so that you can enable search. So indexing to improve data access and search is really important because search, I think, needs to be everywhere on your site, and people identify with search so much that it's a very usable feature to have in your site. And then we have caching as well. So when you, when your site's not performing in some cases in your database, it's taking too much of a load, the query's too long, you got to cache that. So we use caching uh, in, in, in a lot of places. And then uh, you know, we have a list of all the, the toolkits and frameworks we've used. We, we, have, we keep things pretty simple, open source, if we can. So we've got an AJAX library using Yahoo UI. We have Firebug and Wiseflow for our development to really 
you look at HTML and HTTP requests and, and JavaScript and all of that, Yslow is a great performance tool. I would recommend if you if you work in the web, if you know these tools already, then great. If you don't, get to know them because they're very helpful. Indexing through Lucene and any kind of search engine like that, there are a bunch out there for different um, languages um, that, that really helps you helps users get a data using full text search. And then making sure that you have a good database database layer. So caching and, and persistence management is very important when you want to scale. Uh, and you know it allows you to cluster and all that kind of thing. So that's going to make your site usable because it's going to be performant. And then unit tests are important in any case. So I just put them in here because you never want to forget unit tests, even if you're doing usability. OK. So um, you know, as, as you've done this and you've got your site out and you think it's usable, you've got to be able to measure things. So you want to really look at your results. And this is really what we, we came up with. Uh, uh, what we've seen is increased traffic. More people are contributing to the site, and I'll, I'll give you an example of that with the, with the next slide. And then we have uh, you know, better people, uh, more retention in the store, more repeat customers in the store, more people responding to us on the forums and asking for improvements, and more people coming uh, to sign up with us. And it's you know, we also have um, logging in the system now, which I think as a as a site you need to have some kind of audit trail capability because it really helps you to track what users are doing. We can tell what people are doing, how they, a single session, how they're clicking through and stuff. And so we can really, really see people using the features that we've developed. If you have no way to measure your, uh, what, you've, what you've designed, it's really fruitless because you won't be able to tell the results. So always, when you're, when you're designing things, usability or anything, have some way to measure them. And, that, and we've done that. So if I was to give you know, somebody who's starting out or even just trying to be more focused on things for their next project, I would say make your site really work for 80% of the people and be as simple, uh, simple as possible. And the 20% or more complex, hide those features behind uh, you know, well-known uh, actions and, and uh, you know, pop-ups, uh, not pop-ups, but um, have expandable um, workflows for, for the complex cases. And you'll find that if you make it simple for 80% of the people, it's, it's going to serve you very well, and, and um, people will, will really feel like you know they're in control. And asynchronous requests, I think, come up a lot, so don't don't forget that. And make sure your pages load quickly. People's attention span is very very low these days, and, and they want things to be quick. Everything is like a desktop application now, and so you've got to compete and really make sure that your site is responsive and feels like it, it's it's you know running on the, on their machine and not on a website 5,000 miles away. Uh, and um, you know, we're, uh, social networking, community data, um, web 2.0, we want to make um, the, the site collect as much community data as possible. So give people the option to comment on things, to, to, to rate things, and, and just really make them feel like they're contributing to the site because it makes them, it really makes them feel like you know they're on the site, and you want to you want to expose them uh, when they have public profiles. You really want to get people to connect with people because. These days, that's all you know. What websites are about is finding out what other people are saying. They don't really care about some expert who owns a company that tells them this is good and that's bad. It's it's really about what does my friend think and whatever. So, have community be a big part of the aspect. At least for us, it is. Um, and then allow people to personalize things for themselves. So having them have preferences to control how things are displayed, it really makes them feel like it's an application and not a website. Um, and then the last thing I would say is that. After this experience, you really change the way you look at things. Your mindset really becomes focused on usability, and you can be an expert if you if you really focus on that. You can really think about things from the terms of the user. So you know things that we've done that are really kind of focused on usability that maybe I haven't mentioned uh, are things like providing APIs and providing just just thinking about how people can get to your site really easily. Uh, so that involves you know any any kind of access point that someone would 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 want to use. So you know, we've had, we have bloggers who want to have custom access to our site. That makes it more usable if they have an API. We have um, a lot of people who need uh, RSS feeds and, and things like that. So you, if you understand your business and you understand your users, you can be a usability expert because you just have put yourself in their shoes. And you can, if you think about it from their perspective, you can be an expert as long as you keep putting, you know, putting those, uh, putting yourself into that perspective when you're when you're um, designing um, any new features. So one, the last slide I'll, I'll look at is really to show you 
um, an, an interesting uh, graph of what we what we used to uh, what we've had in terms of tasting notes. Tasting notes are reviews of wine. These are the, this is a graph of since we released the number of tasting notes added per day, and as you can see, the trend is that it's going up. Uh, it used to be really flat before we released. I think it was even below where, where it started out there. We would have a pretty flat line of, of people adding tasting notes, and as you can see, it's just increasing um, pretty uh, markedly from when we had the release. And it's um, you know now we've had days where it's going over you know 400, 500. It's 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 getting you know really high use now, which is something that we really really were hoping to achieve. So that shows you that if you make your site uh, focused on the user and give them the tools that they need make it easy for them that you can see the results and, and uh, it's you know just it's, it's a good uh, a good way for you to um, to, to think about um, about your site so I've, uh, I think I'll pass it back now to Prakash to finish off the presentation and I'll take questions at the end if you have any thanks so much for sharing the uh, Winsler uh, case about the lessons learned uh, most of you might be already familiar with the uh, things which I'm going to talk about. Just want to reiterate, the key to success in usable days, we already mentioned about, the usable days is the quality attribute, which covers aesthetics, accessibility, and consistency. Yomas talked about all these aspects, that how simple the user interface would really, you know, bring the target audience to the table. I just want to, you know, just briefly, you know, outline these things. You have to really look for simple interface and look and feel. Many times, it's the break or make kind of things. The break or make is something like, you know, people just immediately realize it. So you have to really bring some coolness into your look and feel. Allow personalization. People prefer to have their own way of doing things and see what they really want to see. So these are all the simple things you can cover in the aesthetics, which will really bring it to the success. Accessibility. You must talk about the screen maps. That is a great way to understand how the accessibility is for your product. Definitely you need to understand what are the important aspects, what are the critical things on my product which I need to expose to my user. And provide it more intuitively. Users don't want to learn new things. So provide as intuitiveness as possible in your navigation. Bring consistency. Whenever you build new things, build something similar to what they're actually familiar with. When you must talked about, even though they revamp their screens, definitely they want to bring something which is similar to what they have seen in the past. So this can actually bring the user to the understanding that, that they are familiar with the interface. Always use standards. I think you know, nothing can be reiterated about these standards. An example I can quote you, usually when you are actually filling up a form, you will provide a notation to represent some of the required fields. I have seen cases where people use notations to represent optional fields. That totally confuses your target audience. Follow the standards. Follow the crowd what it's been used in the industry. Take an example of a delete button. You have to ensure that the consistency is being used in your standards. When you say delete, people use always the, the color of red and across representation. But if you go and use a yellow color and a big dollar sign, it will never make sense of the standards. So that will really create confusion among the users. So the consistency is very important. With all this said, I just want to summarize on how we can really enable these aspects from the technology what we have today. You must talk about a lot of tools. Definitely these could be categorized into some of the technology enablers. Always try to use templates that can help you to bring the consistency. CSS cannot be reiterated because it is the only thing which can bring personalization to your product. And Ajax, I don't want to really repeat the thing which uh, Yomas has mentioned about. With the technology rightly available, you'll be able to bring back some of the lost customer back to your product. And today, people are looking more than the Ajax. They are looking for RAA type of applications. You have to really honor their request and use the right technology which is available today. JavaScript is no longer just treated as a traditional validation engine. It is mature to a level where it can really make a difference. And you must talk about a lot of community interaction. 
Today, the products are expected to interact with the community. The community has a larger say in product success. You really want to bring the interactiveness, the collaborative environment to your product, wherever it's relevant to your application. With all this said, I just want to bring how you can use usability in the product life cycle. In your design phase, if you are already having an existing product, you have to understand what is good about the product and what is really missing in the product. Take the lessons learned, understand your target audience, know the behavior, evaluate your competition, and you must just mentioned about do the design iteratively. It could be a prototype, it could be a wireframe, or it could be a mock screen. Finally, when the design is done, that's what you would actually change over to a development phase. Whatever you have right now, it's something which you really verified it. This is what I want to present it to the user. Now the challenge is how realistically I can bring those designs back into my product. Definitely you will apply some of the guidelines we talked about. Use those technology enablers and implement the usability in your product. Definitely it is not a one-time operation. Once it is done, you have to verify it. Many times, this is the phase which is getting ignored, where the design is being done properly and the implementation really lacks. By following the simple checklist, definitely you will be able to bring back what you are really thought about the usage of the product and how it is being implemented. Then next to the testing phase, you need to do usability testing. It doesn't have to be a formal lab setting. All you need is a representative user to understand the product and see how they are able to use it. You don't have to ask them the question. You just observe them. You'll be able to understand how they are using it. And the beta customer is the best one to test your product. Do the user acceptance testing with the beta customers. You would understand all the difficulties. Probably with all these changes in mind, you'll be able to roll out to the production. This will complete the first iteration of your usability for the product. Again, usability is not something which is fixed for any product. It evolves over a period of time. You need to really measure how it is really usable once it is into the production. You can understand by the metrics. You can understand how it is being used. What are the features being used? Understand the issues coming from the customer. Typically, the first week of production would really give a good indication about what all the usability issues customers are facing. Reevaluate the usability and go back and redo the design. This will complete your complete life cycle of usability. Here's a quick checklist that you'll be able to use in validating your implementation. This is nothing new from what you already know, but just to reiterate, provide the simple navigation, allow shortcuts, allow reversal of actions, never allow manipulation of user window, and ensure that you are able to attract all type of target audience. Don't focus on a single target audience space. Your user information viewing is limited to a few aspects. So ensure you're not allowing user has to scroll many streams. This will ensure that you know you are able to bring at least the basic usability into your product and ensure that you are at least not the best, but at least closer to the best what you can offer to your customer. So with that, I'll just wind up my discussion. Uh, we'll take questions now. So we already have a couple of questions. So uh, a couple of them I addressed to Yomas and uh, one to Prakash. So um, we have very little time, but uh, I'll take them quickly. And uh, in the meanwhile, we'll also have a quick poll you can vote uh, while we're taking the question and answers.
So I'll just go ahead with the first question. This is for you, Yoman. Okay. Um, it says, uh, the question is, how many feature-driven releases do you have in a year? You said you're able to have shorter release cycles. Can you give okay. a little more detail? We, we tend to do six-week iterations, which means every six weeks we're releasing uh, a new feature, at least a new feature set. Um, sometimes we have ma more major releases, so we'll, we'll tend to still do some small releases in between and keep to the uh, six-week timeline, but we might go 12 weeks for something that requires more work. So we'll still do the, the same period, but uh, we might wait, uh, we might skip one where we, re we release something only on the uh, after 12 weeks. So it might be released at six weeks, but hidden from everybody. But it tends to be six weeks, so that would put it put it at about uh, maybe maybe eight releases a year. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, this one for Prakash. Uh, says uh, I mean I think you mentioned some important uh, guidelines. So the question is, how are these guidelines brought in during the design phase? So I covered in the uh, usability life cycle. Some of the things. Uh, you need to understand your customers when you are doing the design. You need to know your target audience. And not all of the aspects of guidelines is brought into the just design case alone. It is spread from design through development through the implementation. So you have to bring some of the aspects of guidelines like understanding the customer, knowing the competition into the design phase so that you'll be able to come up with a better design catering to your target audience and take these inputs to the implementation phase and follow it properly with the checklist and ensure it is being done properly. And finally, test it with the beta customer to ensure it really reaches the target audience. Okay, thanks for that, Prakash. So uh, we just have the results of the poll in, and I think the title of our webinar today says it all. I mean, I think most of the people have voted uh, for usability mattering as uh, the reason for it mattering as you know to stay ahead of the competition as well as it being a differentiator so that's the uh, highest percentage of votes have come in for those so i think uh, yes uh, i think the topic is justified as you know software, software usability it can be a true differentiator so that's great so let's just go ahead to the next question here um, this is for yomas again it says um, the question is agile development and usability do they go together uh, I understand that usability has to be a part of the initial design itself, and once you start receiving feedback from your users, do you go around changing the design? That's a good question. I would say, you know, they definitely go together because without agile development, um, you wouldn't be able to change things, and most of the time with usability, you never really can think what a user is going to do ahead of time. So most of it goes hand in hand. You're getting feedback, and you want to, you want to set a, uh, a a consistent approach. You want to make sure that you're going to get people who want everything and they can't have everything. So you've got to really come up with a consistent plan of how your pages are going to be laid out, how your interface is going to be laid out so that it won't please everybody, but you want to, do a, you want to try and please at least 80% of the people and make them happy. So with us, I, I can show, you know, the screens I showed you weren't the same way when we first designed them. They were slightly different and we've had feedback based on, you know, we need something to be more visible. Some, some, that some, sometimes there were too many actions on the screen. So we've, we've ha definitely had to iterate that way, but you also don't want to stray too far from what your core, um, your core interface um, guidelines are. So some users may always, uh, will always ask for things that are beyond what your, what your site is capable of and beyond what you're trying to present to a user. So you've got to, you've got to really make sure that uh, you, you stick to your, um, to your plan uh, as far as as a as a as a company, or what you want an interface to look like, but you want to listen to users, and the only way you can do that is through agile development. And it's going to be a little bit a little bit tough when you release something for the first time because you're going to get a flood of requests, and eventually people will either get used to it, and and you'll assimilate the the, the major changes, and you'll get a sense of what really matters based on how users are complaining about it. If you get more than a few complaints about something, then you probably do want to change it. If you get one person complaining about something or asking for a change, you probably want to think about them as an expert user that you 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 know you might not be able to satisfy. 
So you you really got to you really got to think about it, and having a good product development, a product manager on board really helps um, to make the call when you want to do something or not. So being agile is definitely you know helps us get things out quickly and 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 iteratively improve our interface. But we haven't changed a whole lot, uh, maybe since the the first six months that the product was out there. So it, it definitely gets easier as people get used to it. And you do want to enforce um, your your look of things. I think the first time I used Google Mail, I didn't really feel happy with a lot of things because I was used to using Hotmail and I was like, you know, I was wondering why do I have to use labels and all that. But now, you know, if you change the perception a little bit, people people will come around as well. So. Okay, thanks for uh, taking that. Uh, Yomas, I think there's a related question. Uh, you probably covered it a bit, but if you want to uh, talk a little more about it, uh, it says, uh, from my understanding, Agile is more about implementation and not about anything else. Hence, usability and Agile may not go together well. Uh, I would like to understand your thoughts, uh, if you want to address that. Okay. I, I, you know, I, I think of Agile in the most generic sense of being able to keep up with what's happening uh, out there in terms of your product, in terms of business model, in terms of anything. It doesn't have to be about development. So. Agile can apply to pretty much any aspect of business, and that's and in these days when you have companies that are so small that people are running out of their garage, people are running from their home. You know, a lot of people are laid off and they're starting their own businesses at home. Uh, they're all agile. They're all trying to do the next best thing. So, it's being agile really just means trying to keep up with what's happening with your competitors and really trying to stay one step ahead of them. And and being agile as a company, being agile as a as an employee, um, contributing ideas, uh, and in development, yes, it, you know that's where it started. But everybody, even like, you know, I would say every team that we have in our company is trying to change its process all the time, and that's really being agile, trying to make sure that we can cope with, with uh, you know, a tighter economy, making sure that we can cope with, cope with a, a different market out there. Um, it's 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 really uh, something that it's it's just a mindset, and you can you can use the the principles behind agile. In many different disciplines, and not just engineering. Okay, thanks again for that, Yuma. Uh, I think we're running out of time here. Uh, or on the lighter side, we were asked, we were, we were told that our slides were not usable. Uh, so, uh, sorry about that, everyone, because uh, we have Yuma uh, presenting this uh, webinar from the US, and uh, we're sitting here at India. So, I guess uh, there's a bit of problems with the control. So, uh, I I know it wasn't very usable. Sorry about that, but. Uh, Hope uh, the rest of the session was well and I uh, went well and uh, I hope um, all of you uh, had a chance to uh, I mean gain something from it. Uh, if you have any more questions, please feel free to uh, direct it to your mother and Prakash at that email given here. Uh, we'll also be sending you the slide deck uh, shortly after the presentation uh, 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 in a day or so. So uh, thank you everyone for joining and I think we'll wrap it up now because we're running out of time. Thank you, Yomaz. Thanks everyone for joining in. Great to have you here with us today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure.